did nothing with chaos, everything would work out. I honestly believe that. You just kind of wait it out in, in a way. The house was built or finished in 1918. Uh, so it's one of the oldest houses on this block. Although this house is older. This house, I guess, was finished in 1910. So you got some pretty old houses here. Five years ago, there was a freak windstorm. And do you see how on the left there, it's that there was another big, huge branch of that tree. Well, the wind blew it out and it speared through the roof, through the ceiling, and into the store. Just by simply selling music, you're kind of supporting change and progress. When I hear a song that I connect with, there is nothing else that I've ever done emotionally that I, you know that I connect with like that. Nothing. I listen to like some crazy classic or some crazy jazz music, even crazy old school metal music, you know. I feel like I feel more of a human being. This place is sort of a last bastion of a real social environment. I can't put a value or a price tag or a definition to coming to the House of Records. It's just part of life for me. We could have tons of little mom, mom and pop stores like they did at one time, and each would have their own little niche. That's not happening. place like this being in an old house is another strong reason that to you know to pull people in you walk up the steps to the blue house of records literally and open that creaky old door it's not at all corporate which is just great you know especially in the days when i mean people are working in cubicles and people have dress codes while it was a record store People lived here, so it doubled as a house and a business. A library, a museum, it's, it's fun to come in and just look at history. The store is shaped like a horseshoe, which is lucky. This house is, you know, totally dilapidated. The wood floors are, you know, have been treaded on for years. And we've got stuff jammed in every corner. Personally, when I'm surrounded by records, I like it. Um, I like tall walls of records. That's what I have at my house. I like the smell of the store, the way, I don't know, the vinyl, the, the album covers, the little, the bit of mustiness. Jazz is in the living room and, you know, <laughs> the, the reggae is in the family room. It's an old house with a bunch of nooks and crannies and corridors that come up unexpectedly and kids love it. Oh, 1795 cash. And then 17 cash again. This is really one of the neatest parts in the house, I think, right here, where, I mean, you know, it goes through this little corridor here and, and out this way and, you know, over here. And now, now you're in this room. And I have people come in who, they just rave about these, these old wood floors. The bathtub was, was right here. This is still a sink, uh, although, I don't think it's usable. I think it's, no, no, it is, it is not. And then for kids who have never even seen a place where people are writing down the stock, you know, on, on this old cash register, um, it's quaint. For a while later on during my heavy years of consumption, it would be just like, a, it'd be like stopping for a beer after work. I would detox by coming into House of Rex. Well, it's 70s funky, just like I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem institutional. It almost feels like somebody's bedroom with a lot of records in it, you know, there's posters up and it's just kind of like homey and laid back and organized but not not overly organized. You have this like interaction with the people 
they're in the aisle and you have to be like, oh, excuse me, and like you're looking around and it creates this like kind of fun, interesting tension, but people are like too committed to be annoyed to leave, so everybody's just kind of like on top of each other. It's a comfortable place to come and browse and look through uh, the products that they have and, um, and remember. Sue, are you down here? Yes. Excellent. We're coming down. Um, an action shot of Martha working it, along with all, all these boxes and boxes of CDs. She's at this very moment pulling a CD that will make us money, I, th I think. See, as you can see here, there's a crack in the foundation. Um, that's not good. Um, and so every once in a while there's some, some water leakage when it's really, really rainy. Um, this computer right here does not work. Shall we go even further into the bowels of this, this wonderful basement? These are Gare's records, um, just a portion of them. But uh, um, at one point, the basement flooded a little bit, and a bunch of his records got wet. So we took them all off the bottom shelves and took them upstairs and dried them out. Love is a two-way street. Somebody lived in this room, and so they, they painted that. But you really got to see this. One of my favorite spots. There's a, a relic there. That is uh, some young male, I'm sure, um, <coughs> decorated his door. Some Playboy nudes. Uh, clearly, these are this is all very 70s. Kids grew up here. People made love here. People had parties. I, I mean, you know, it's just life happens in a house. Lots of things happen. A lot of this businesses down this street here are in houses. Coming up here is a bicycle shop, and that's in an old house. And then the Bijou Theater, which is in a church. Look at that building. That's a parking garage, you know, and they've got some eateries down there underneath. Um, but, you know, is that really inviting? This here used to be a gas station, but now it's just a gutted, empty lot. Ugh. I guess one of the quirks about Eugene is just people being allowed to do what they want to do and letting their freak flag fly just a little bit. Um, and, and it's okay to be a little different in Eugene. I almost feel like right now, we're in a different town, or a separate part of town, or a different place. A lot of cities look like this. This could be anywhere. Can you see the Butte? Spencer Butte back there? Is it, is it there? Yeah. I, you know, I just, that's really like a real bellwether in town. You know where you are. You can always get your bearings when you look at that and see it. Valley River with an American flag and an Oregon state flag right above it. That just says it all, doesn't it? I mean, how different is this than the mall in Buffalo or the mall in Los Angeles? You know, and then out there, there's, there's the river. But you don't get to really see that. Ooh, look at this paint job. You can uh, just look at uh, rows upon rows of parked cars. You don't want to spend time here. You don't want to bring your family and, you know, put out a picnic and sit there and hang out. It's just so stark in comparison to the neighborhood I work in, you know, where there's, you know, uh, old houses and trees. I used to have nightmares when I was a child of being in a room and having it grow bigger and bigger and bigger and I was just really, really small inside that room. And that's kind of how I feel when I'm in this, this kind of area. This place has a lot of history. There have been a lot of people who have lived here and walked around on these floors, and uh, I feel it. My name's Tissy Bryan, and I lived in this house until 58 or 59. I remember really shitty, ugly, gray wallpaper with pink and yellow on it. But I do remember the squeaking hardwood floors. I love that sound. 
A few years ago, I went down in the basement, and there used to be a concrete shelf about four, three feet wide along this east wall, and that's where my mother dried walnuts from the two walnut trees out in front. Oh, okay. And it was a sawdust furnace, and it smelled really good down there. <laughs> coming to Oregon from Hawaii, and I remember all the girls dressed in weird clothes. Met a guy who pretended to be a werewolf here. He always had werewolf teeth. One of my memories of this house is when I met my friend Etta at school, and I brought her home, and my mother was unpacking uh, things to hang up on the walls and decorative items and she was hanging up some wooden plates that had been hand-painted that she'd gotten when we lived in Germany. And my friend asked her who painted those, that they looked like her mother's work. And it turned out they were her mother's work. She lived in a displaced persons camp. She was from Latvia. She had been a law student when the war broke out. And sure enough, her name was on the back. That was pretty amazing. And this was my bedroom. Is there anything about this space that uh, looks similar to that? Or no. You... No, but I bet that ugly wallpaper is still up there underneath some of that stuff. No, it's, it's totally different looking. Mostly I come here because they have good music. And unusual music. Yeah. Yeah. Why come here and not some other store, you know, like a... Yeah, I like I to know. come to my old house. To me, a record store is like an oyster, only it's guaranteed to have a pearl inside. In fact, it's loaded with pearls. People come here to find music that's hard to find. If you can see it on TV, we probably don't have it. From totally obscure labels that, that really only people who dig and dig and dig into music are going to even know. If somebody wants to hear some deep soul, they don't really have any place else to go to but here. We have a whole punk and indie section. So the reggae CDs start here. We sell local music. Jazz. Blues. Vocalists and easy listening. Strange special occasion music, carnival music. All the soundtracks here, original cast here, opera, international, um, Brazilian and African music. Independent hip hop. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's just blowing up. We sell music for any and all occasions. Uh, there was a time when we had a Charles Manson CD out in the rags. And then we got Christmas LPs. We sell them all year round, believe it or not. There are lots of small pockets of music fans in Eugene who are sophisticated and will go out and explore types of music that are hard to come by. I don't buy hits or what's in, you know what I mean? Going off of the commercial, you know, the, the satellite stuff and all that, you know, you just sort of get what they give you. A store like this, you have the choice of of uh, pursuing your own musical interests instead of conforming yourself to someone else's. And they definitely cater to both a more mainstream and a more kind of underground taste in music, which is great because you can pretty much find whatever you're looking for. That whole recycling of music that happens on such a large scale here, it's wonderful. I'm a, I'm a fussy bread eater, so I go to a certain store to get a certain type of bread, even though other stores are closer. Um, the same with music. People in one circle don't know about the other. and. Uh, I love it. I love the sensation in, in House of Records that it's all happening all at once, all the music that you love. It's in many ways sort of like a library, although, you know, kind of a crazy, chaotic rock and roll library. One of my main tasks is to clean records. There is no way that there's anything negative about cleaning records. <laughs> This is the one thing that I do in my life where I absolutely know I'm doing the right thing. When I'm 
I'm spending my time usefully, and I'm contributing something to the world, and I'm taking dirt off of records. That's one of the things I love about used records, is what the previous owner did to them. Unless it's horrible and offensive, you know. Greg doesn't like it when people write their names on record covers, but I kind of like that, actually. <laughs> we find all kinds of things inside the records, too, that we buy from people. Um, you know, a lot of times it's just something cool like an, a newspaper article from when the record came out, a review of the record, or something like that. But then, you know, there's also letters that people have written to each other, um, photographs, um, and of course, um, you know, pot seeds and stuff like that, too. But once in a while, somebody will, I'll find a, a you know, piece of notebook paper and uh, a pencil review of the album, which I just love that, you know, especially when it's written kind of like a... A in a journalistic style, um, but usually not very professional, you know. It, it's pretty nice. Uh, people bring in records when it rains. I don't know why. I guess maybe they're cleaning out their garages or something. All that work. $1.95. <laughs> and that looks bad, but of course it'll dry out. And then it'll, it won't be discolored at all. It's just neat to get a big bonanza of, of records that somebody has lovingly correct, collected, um, but also they don't necessarily enjoy parting with them. So it's a little bit painful at times. Um, you know, it hurts people a little bit to let go of their records. But most of the time it's just they, they look at them and they touch them, kind of say goodbye. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> and they remember things. Every once in a while they'll be like, oh, I can't sell you that one. They take it, take it away with them, even though they have no record player left, you know. But they have to, they have to have that wild, that first wild cherry record, because it reminds them of when they lost their virginity or whatever. <laughs> I'm sure people have horrible associations with some of their records too. A lot of people are just, you know, super proud of themselves. They've replaced them all. We've got them all on CD, except for a couple, and uh, so. I don't know, they think they're moving up in the world or something. <laughs> the best people to buy records from are the ones who, um, they just don't listen to them anymore and they want to trade them in for some new ones. Nobody in the world wants this record except maybe me. I might not even want this record. So... What, what appeals? What, why does that record appeal to you? Well, I'm, I collect organ music. So and soundtracks. So, you know, this is kind of straddles both of those, but it's pro it's like my least favorite kind of organ music and my least favorite kind of soundtrack music. So, there's a really strong chance that I'm not going to like it. Um, one time we've been lucky enough to buy one of the most highly coveted records, which is the first edition of the Introdu Introducing the Beatles record. We were able to buy that record once. It was just such a thrill. It's a record we might get um, several thousand dollars for. So we might do really well on that record. But we told the person, you know, exactly what it was and how much we thought we were gonna get for it and how much work it would be to try and get that for it not, you know, it's not a very high paying job. Um, we've got no insurance, uh, but the job satisfaction is aces. Being able to be around records and get paid for it is just like a dream come true for me. I spend a lot of time taking sticky stuff off records and then putting more sticky stuff on the records. 
take it off. Put it on. Landmarks in any community help to bond the members of that community. If this were in other countries, this would be called a marketplace. And I don't mean a place of selling and buying. Music is, I think, you know, it's a fundamental part of the human experience, you know, as is connection and relationship. Because when I was a kid, I used to go to the record stores. That's, that's part of the inspiration, too. Hanging out, talking to people. It's just sort of a nice place to meet. Old ladies are standing next to hippies who are standing next to punk rockers who are standing next to college students. I mean, I've helped teenagers come in here who are buying records for the first time. I see friends uh, accidentally find, them, find each other here or end up talking sometimes for a long time. And more than anything, as a facilitator of people, uh, listening to music, it brings people together because music brings people together and that, once again, is a total cliche, but true. It's kind of like going into a bar where everybody knows your name or something, you know, you feel at home. When I first moved here from Denver, when I was finishing up high school in South Eugene, uh, I mean, the first thing I did was find the record stores, you know what I mean? That's just, this is what I did. And so my first week here, automatically I was hanging out here, you know, I would get, I know, when I was at school at lunch, um, I didn't know anybody, um, I would come here. My ex-boyfriend and I, like a year ago came in here and, and we're going to ask if they just wanted people to help out for free. Be, both because we were new here and we wanted to kind of find uh, a niche in the community. It's a place where all of these forms of music live together comfortably and people come and visit them. The feeling is all around you. <laughs> I think it's kind of cheesy but maybe it, it is like a, a sacred kind of place. It's a collective part of like me and my my friends' lives. All of us have our customers, our fans, who come in and want to talk. How you doing, Greg? I'm doing just great. How about you, sir? Okay. Here on a Sunday, huh? The owner and I, you know, we'd come in, we'd, we'd talk baseball. It's sort of like, you know, you know what you'd, you'd envision in a, in a little village shop. Some of my closest friends from over the years are, are co-workers and regulars. Bands you know, band members come here and post their flyers. Um, of course, you know, we have to deal with people abusing that, that privilege as well. Recently, somebody set fire to our bulletin board. I mean, the idea of like doing, having like basement shows, and the idea of, of being like small bands, the idea of, of trying to make your own CDs, the idea of trying to be like, um, just trying to do something, trying to move something, or trying to at least express something and get that out to the people. I mean, having small places is exactly how you get that done. I think without that, things feel kind of aimless. Hey, whatever works for you, Katie. <laughs> it's upbeat. The people are always happy. I can always talk to them. They all have a sense of humor. Oh, uh, we just like to put uh, album covers up in front of our faces that are silly looking. Uh, and this one can double, where you get the back cover too. Uh, um, well, that's pretty cool. How's that? Is that, is that close? It's <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> Does that, does that work out? That's pretty good. But there's Joe Cocker. That's pretty. That's pretty ugly. You got it? I <laughs> got it. <laughs> we have a guy who calls on the phone every day and he goes through the same trip every time, you know. Who is this? What are you wearing? Same questions every time. Sometimes we tell him, well, you know, I'm wearing a G-string and a top hat and um, combat boots. You get everything, you know, people who want to prove to you that they don't give a shit that you work at a record store, <laughs> you know what I mean? So they're kind of like schmucks to you. One of my partners said the record slammed over his head. Strip away the business end and, you know, and it's it's no different than, than the living room of, you know, of your best friend's house. Really sort of a family business, even though none of us is related? Are you, am I a pony for you to ride the like a horse? Oh, no. no. So the boss's son was conceived here in the store, <laughs> so there's a little fact for you. <laughs> Mike Herman, you know, he's, we might as well have a dining room table later for him. This is his stop every day. Sometimes the, the only people I speak to during some days are just the people who are here. I mean, I go to the grocery store and then I go home or whatever, but this place is always a place of, you know, someone making sure you're okay. It's a really old attitude. Yeah, you know, it's part of my family heritage. You help each other. You build a house together if you have to. It's just 
like a maze down there. It's like walking through catacombs almost. Boxes stacked, you know, filled with records and very narrow corridors and spider webs. And it's, it's a little scary, actually. And it's actually very scary being here late at night. I've come in a couple of times and worked past midnight and uh, I'm ready to go, you know, <laughs> after midnight, especially when it just seems like the house sort of wakes up. One time I had to leave. One time it just got to me where I just, I could feel someone behind me. And I just felt like, ah, oh, geez, you know, I, you know, I don't want to just run away. <laughs> I mean, I kind of felt like just running out of the house screaming, but I was okay. I, I dealt with it. But now if I get a sense of, you know, that there's somebody behind me or somebody around me, I, I talk to them or I say something or, I don't know, or, or I'll play some music and I just know I feel it and I know other people have talked to me who have worked around it, have felt it too. This photograph came inside of a record album that I happened to bring up one day and listen to and out it fell and I thought, wow, what a neat photograph. It's sort of creepy and blurry and it's all ladies uh, and anyway, I was intrigued so I took it home and put it on my refrigerator. And it was in my house for a couple of months, uh, just sitting there on the refrigerator. But I noticed that during the time that I kept it in my house, I was hearing some very unusual noises. Uh, whenever I was up in the attic, it sounded like furniture was being moved in my living room. I could hear the table dragging across the floor, or chairs, and it was very creepy, very eerie. And I wondered what it could be. Every time I came downstairs, everything was where it should be. But I thought, what is that noise? And what's causing it? So one day, or one night, I was up in the attic and I heard it again. And I walked downstairs. And the first thing I saw was this photograph on my refrigerator. And so I thought, hmm, I wonder if it has anything to do with me bringing that, this photograph into my home. So I decided I needed to return it to the House of Records, uh, where there are plentiful ghosts and spirits, and, and uh, it seems right at home here. I've hung it on the wall uh, back here behind the register, along with another photograph that I found out in the front yard, um, and I haven't had any ghost problems in my own home since. It, it exists, and so yeah, so we brought this picture here so that they could uh, be among friends, I guess you could say. A lot of times it's just the three of us, and we get together on a week, weekend night and just listen to three records that are different. Know, Sarge and I started doing it, and then Johnny came in, and then we always invite Martha. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we've invited other people too. I mean, I don't want to make it into a club or something like that, you know. I just like to uh, listen to records with people. and. When, when it gets to be too many people, we've found that it's too many people. Yeah. Well, we've brought that up to, to, some, to some friends that, and told them about our, our listening parties or just were discussing the past, and, and, and there's been a response of, oh, yeah, I, I want to do that too, and, but they, they picture it more as like a sing-along. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when we actually describe <laughs> what we do, they're just they're dumbfounded. You know, they're like, you just sit there and don't really talk that much and listen. I think when we take albums, they're generally things that have made a big impact on us when we were younger or something that right then that we're really, really interested in. Or we'll just chat about something and someone will bring up an older band or Greg will be like, you haven't heard that? And then I'll put on Traffic, Dear Mr. Fantasy. Oh yeah, that was and then, great. And then Johnny and I are just like, this is ridiculously good. Yeah, we're, maybe we're connecting with something that's old. There's a New York Times article about albums, the, the format falling out of favor that people now are more into just one song at a time. And so we're trying to revive, or, well, not revive, because it's, I just can't believe it's dead, but just keep going the tradition of listening, you know, with other people. So what's the first record? Uh, it's, it's an album called Parachute <laughs> by The Pretty Things. What, what did I do? So I'll go put, turn it on right now. I was being honest. <laughs>
I'll tell you the story of the night I, um, I left the store <coughs> and I was, um, I went to um, ride the bus home and I missed the bus. So I had to come back to the store. Uh, I, well, I didn't have to, but I decided, oh, I have a, f a few things to do. It was like, I don't know, eight o'clock or so. And so I walked in the door and I saw piles of CDs this high. Um, everywhere. I, I had been gone f 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Um, so I looked around and thought, what is this? And I started to walk very slowly this way. And I saw piles of CDs. And I just, you know, I was increasingly feeling weirder and weirder. And, and it, was, it was dark in here. There were no lights on. And I walked here. And suddenly this guy jumped up from behind this rack here. And, you know, I was dumbfounded, I, and he was a big guy. And, uh, and I, I would, you know, couldn't think of anything to say. I mean, I just, so I said, you know, the stupidest thing that you could possibly say, which is, what are you doing here? Uh, and he sort of smirked and, you know, I'm like, I could see the wheels turning. Geez, what a stupid question. And he said, well, what do you think I'm doing? And I said, I think you're stealing. You know, I mean, he was planning a heist here. And so we both started walking this way. He was on this side of the racks. I was on this side of the racks. And uh, I invited him to leave. Uh, so I went over to the door and opened the door and let him out. And he came back um, and uh, broke down the back door the next night. And the police caught him. So they took this guy away. They put him in jail for a night. He got out. And three days later, he came back again. And he, he took the hinges off the back door this time. And he actually got away with some stuff. One night, we went out, Gary and I, with baseball bats, walking the alleys, looking for this guy in the night. About two months later, I was reading the newspaper, and I see the guy's picture. Turns out that he had stolen from uh, uh, Payless, or Hirons, up the street. Um, those uh, oxygen tanks. Uh, he was one of those guys who used to get high with the plastic over his head and, and he would take nips of, I don't know, what is it, oxygen or nitrogen or something, and uh, he would get high. Well, he suffocated and died. And so his, his place was filled with some of our CDs and you know a bunch of other stuff that he'd stolen. And, um, and I just thought to myself, that's what you get for stealing from the House of Records, you know, and just like, it was relentless. The guy just wouldn't leave us alone. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, that's, whenever I walk through this, this place at night, I, I think about that, that guy leaping up from behind the, the racks like that, that uh, scared me. I do have to say, though, that most of our customers are male. I mean, most of the people who come into this shop are boys or men. You know, I wonder why that is. I think, in general, music is, I guess, an industry where women have been discriminated against historically. Like, they're, it's harder for women to have a career in music. It's harder for women to be recording artists or to work in music. So I guess it's probably because most of the artists are men. Sometimes I wonder, well, geez, aren't girls as interested in music as boys are? And they are, I think, but I definitely think that the numbers show that boys are more interested or at least frequent the store more than girls do. I mean, it is sometimes a little bit intimidating to walk into a record store and be the only female in there. And it's all these guys with their record collections kind of like dorking out about it and you feel like a little bit excluded. Let me tell you, when the store is full of girls, I recognize it. I'll lower the stereo and say, the store is full of girls right now because it just makes me feel so great, you know? Mm -hmm. So, here's some Chad Baker. Great, thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, and none of them are priced, so I could do that for you. I don't think we're just about selling stuff. You know, I think we're really an important place to come and learn. And you're supposed to like be influenced by the things you see, see things you don't know what they are, and be interested in them that you just wouldn't know even where they were, you know? From that knowledge of checking out all this music, we now have knowledge of what to order, 
And then when people come in asking about it, we can actually talk about that music with them. What are you listening to? Uh, Devo. Oh, it's instrumental. Close. Do you know her music at all? Um, a little bit. I know some of it. It's a good representation. Are you looking? Album, um, well, this is one of the weaker albums, in my opinion. Oh, yeah? I mean, you could do some research online and find out about music and records. But it's different than talking about it with somebody. It's changing our views and our whatever information we carry about music and culture is uh, yeah. it's what keeps us human. All right, Bobby Short is K Razy for Gershwin. Can share things with you about about uh, various uh, performers and so forth that you don't know anything about. Some of them are just great. Uh, what's the guy Chivo Barraro? Those are fantastic. Oh, yeah, God, yeah. That's just a great Lots record. Lots of Moog stuff. And... So there's some new band, the White Stripes, and some you know 12 year old kid is digging them, and they start looking into what Jack White likes, you know, or listen to, and the next thing you know, we got kids in here looking for the Stooges, you know, that that stuff will constantly be influential, and then people who really are into it will look into what Iggy Pop was listening to you know, what influenced him. And then they're gonna find like this really obscure blues stuff. So it's an old uh, song from so, uh, yeah. Oh, it's a new uh, song? Do you want this? It's an old song. Yeah. Okay. Another customer will have a question and one of the staff will field it to me if it's about something that I know about. There's always music we haven't heard and the only way to find out is to hear it. You know, the selection of music they'll play in here is always fun and interesting and random. Yesterday, uh, I decided before I purchase this for myself, I'll try one more time to sell it. And we played it in the store and somebody heard it and, and was just thrilled. He had never heard anything like it before. It's very difficult to hear 1970s Turkish prog psych. They know the music. I mean, you look at the talk of the guy, he knows the Shostakovich fifth. I went and I bought a, a St. Matthew's Passion from Germany and the guy knew that performance. There, there tends to be that view of record stores as you know, these sort of exclusive places and the people who work there are snobs. And... To some extent that's true. There's a lot of record store clerks that are like that and we try and buck that trend. So you have Sergio Mendes here, but I need to find for what it's worth. And I don't know which album it's on. All right, then let's you find it. Song? Uh, you mean stop, hey, what's yeah. that sound? Everybody hey, look, what's, what's going sound? on? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, and you want it by Sergio Mendes? Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. I had no idea. They did it, and they did the best version of it. And okay. It's hard to find the record, and I don't know which record it is. It's not like, you know, it's a club or anything, but it's a culture. I mean, I could go down to Best Buy and talk to some ass clown. Every one of those stores is the same, and they're all the same, and they assume that you, as a consumer, are all the same. And uh, that kind of anonymity and distance I can do without. It's like there's this awkward uh, conversation and, and, and tension between uh, people at a corporate store, you know, and, and most of the time they, ha you know, they have no idea what you're talking about. You know, sometimes maybe people take themselves too seriously when they work at a record store, but I think they should take themselves seriously as promulgators of fine art. And you go to places that are like this, that are like, they're small, community-minded, and it's also run by people who love music. Like, you know, my job is not to like, try to like, trick somebody into buying an album. It's like, I listened to this yesterday, it rules, check it out. There's a lot of pride in, in the store. I think people are missing out on a great thing if they don't know us. People still want to hold records in their hand, and CDs, and look at them, and look at covers. It's a work of art. That's why it's called House of Records. <laughs> they haven't changed their name to House of CD yet, or House of Cassette, or House of Download. Vinyl is such a great alternative. You can't download it. Doing my part to keep them around as long as possible. So yeah, so here we have Ogden's Nut Gone Flake by the Small Faces. They have nice packaging. I mean, you're getting a 12 by 12 cover you know, with pictures and maybe a blurb on the back. The jackets in LP format are just beautiful. Um, they're never going to be replaced. First of all, I can read what's here. A CD gives you almost a quarter of what's here. It opens up. 
in a great way. So here's the inside. The inside is these beautiful pictures of the band. I kind of resisted it for a long time because I thought it was so kind of like hipster faddish. That I... But then when I did get a record player, I was really happy. You have vinyl. It's, uh, it's really evident that, uh, that this is something that's highly important to you. And there's something about like being with your friends and like putting on vinyl and just having vinyl and like my living room is just my record player and my records, you know? Records kind of are, are in a way, they're, they're just more physical of an object, but in a way that makes you kind of respect them more. I think so, you know? Let alone the fact that they also sound better, they're more fun to listen to and they're, they're just the records they rule. I've had kids come in and tell me I lost my iPod and I lost 3,000 songs or whatever, you know? And it's kind of hard to lose your record collection. You know, they could have done it this way, which there's nothing wrong with this. It's got two sides, front with Ossie Davis and, and Ruby D. Um, and back for some information, but but they did it this way. I just think it's great. There's there's a whole little ceremony. There's a thing you can do with records that you can't do with an iPod. A record is not this. It's a whole ritual of cleaning your album and playing it. Spin it around. You hear the static when you brush it with your brush. I mean, it's... Records are so wonderful. I don't know. It's kind of strange to talk about having a relationship with something that you just purchased, but I do feel like you can just connect to the music more if you have it. Just more fun than pressing play on iTunes. At some point, I kind of miss the aspect of going to the record store, leafing through, you know, actually having the physical, you know, album there, cover art, all that stuff, and uh, talking to somebody about the music. Uh, all that's part of, I think, a healthy experience. MP3s are put out all the time, but there's no first pressing MP3. It's complicated. I like it because it's complicated. <laughs> this is another one that I just stared at and stared at and stared at when I was a kid. Um, Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. A lot of times I'll buy used vinyl for the cover. Like I used to have a whole wall in my old apartment when I lived in Spokane that was all like record sleeve and then the record like in like a checkerboard on this whole one whole wall and and there's just all kinds of little intricate stuff the band members are in these little musical note bubble things well you know it's a sweeter sound it's a sound with more dimension to it essentially it's just a lot of noise underneath the in the deep in the groove it gives it the warm sound it adds a bigger dimension to their musical experience. Recent um, reissues by the Rolling Stones that are on hybrid super audio CD slash CD sound clean and bright, and that's not what the Rolling Stones are supposed to sound like. The Rolling Stones are supposed to sound kind of murky and rough, and the way they sound on record. Yeah. Here's a, a pot that's stuff's coming out of its butt. I mean, why does a pot have a butt anyway? Some people are, are real serious collectors and just want to have everything that came out on a certain label. And so there's that sort of collector's mentality. And then there's, of course, the audiophiles who come in here and just are really looking for, you know, the perfect sound. I like getting the new record more than listening to it. So I think that makes me a neurotic collector type. In this pocket you get, um, well first of all an invitation to join the Elton John fan club. I have to get another record to make, to say, to say that. We also sell a lot of 7 inch singles to people who own jukeboxes. So I've got some customers who come in and order, you know, uh, new pressings of old hits. I really don't like this artwork at all. <laughs> but, you know, for those that do, it certainly would lose a lot in a CD booklet. And download this. I Try. Just go ahead and try. Slowly it's been gaining more converts. We're selling more records than anything else these days. So it's exciting to see kids you know, being interested in vinyl again, because that takes a little more time. And maybe, you know, we're breeding a group of more patient people. I hope so. It's very important that, uh, that we keep them in circulation and uh, that people continue to enjoy them for many years to come.
We called him the knit cap guy. He always wore this knit cap. He had a very long gray beard, uh, kind of a flat face. He looked kind of Russian. And this guy was a lot of work. He would bring up records and ask us to play them and never buy them, basically. And so we did this over and over with him. He was looking for this Planet P song forever. And finally it came in, got it for him. He asked to hear it, didn't want it. Um, he made me play Zebra once. That was just awful, you know, just unbelievable stuff. So anyway, this guy, the knit cap guy, we, every time we saw him, we'd want to run. Well, one day he comes in and he's selling some CDs, which was interesting, or tapes, they were tapes actually. This was like 1987, 88. And he brings in some tapes, and I wanted two of them, so I offered him two bucks. And we have a paid out slip where, you know, you, <coughs> you ask the customer their name. So I asked him his name and he said, Franz. I said, okay, Franz, what's your last name? Uh, Kafka. He said, your name is Franz Kafka. Yeah. I said, okay, you know, so I wrote Franz Kafka on there and had him sign the paid out slip, paid him his $2 and he left. Well, I had a plan for the next time I saw him. So the next time he comes in, brings in some more tapes to sell, I buy the tapes, I ask him his name, he says Franz Kafka. So that's very mis interesting, Mr. Kafka. I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a big fan of yours, but I've read a few of your books and I just happen to have brought the trial here to work with me and I was just wondering if you'd sign it for me. And he kind of smiled. It was the first time that I, you know, had any kind of interaction with him where that was a little bit human, you know, uh, where he wasn't demanding something from me. And so he signed the book, the trial for me to Greg from the grave, Franz Kafka. The future of independent record stores is, is grim because the record industry, I feel, doesn't really care about record stores. I think the record industry would much rather just, whatever it is, file sharing or selling you know, direct to the consumer for 99 cents a song or, or whatever. I think that we are middlemen and that they probably don't like that. You go somewhere you can get it cheaper. You're supporting something there that I don't think I I don't feel comfortable supporting at all. I'd, I'd rather spend an extra dollar, if, you know, if that's what it means, than to uh, try to find something cheap online or at a Walmart or something. Best Buy, Circuit City, and places like that selling CDs for less money than they pay. They'll buy a CD and spend like, you know, nine bucks to get it in their store and sell it for six ninety nine, And that's cutthroat competition. The focus at Best Buy, as I know it, is electronics, primarily. And so music is really secondary. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've had come in here bragging to me how they just bought, you know, Miles Davis at Circuit City for seven ninety nine. you know, and I'm selling it for eleven ninety five. Other stores definitely directed more towards retail. It's number a game. We're, we're certainly not numbers. If it were a number a game, we wouldn't be open. I hate to just blame downloading for the downfall of the record industry and record stores. I really want to say that that's not the reason that record stores are going under. The record industry does not realize that its product is too expensive and that downloading is a symptom of the problem. It is not the cause. Because they were trying to squeeze as much out of the consumer for as long as possible. They later told the public that they were dropping prices, but what they didn't drop was the actual cost to the stores. So we, as the store, are paying the same. They just tell the customer that, the, oh, the retail cost will be less. But who can afford to do that? ACDC, back in black, got reissued on CD. I don't know, six or seven years ago, at eleven ninety-five, I sold a ton of them. Then the suits at Atlantic said, "Wow, we're making all this money on ACDC Back in Black. Let's make more." So they rose the price. They raised it to sixteen ninety-five. Stopped selling. Stopped it cold. Had they dropped the price of CDs down to ten dollars retail, which you know drop our cost as well to purchase them, 
and then sell them to the consumer at 995. I don't think even as CD burners and iPods came out, there would have been as drastic a drop in sales. If the record industry realized that they've got a good thing, but they just don't need to make that much money. Is the artist getting paid, you know, more? But the truth is, is that things like iPods allow people to hear a few tracks, and if they are music collectors, they'll come and they'll tell us. You know, a lot of people don't do that as their full-time gig, and I want to support them, you know, it plays a big role in my life, and, you know, I want to help them out, help artists that I really enjoy out, and uh, so that's obviously a big part of it. Two, I want to support people that work here and support the store. I think it's a great thing. I think it's essential to community. It seems like cheating, not only to the maybe the person who initially made the recording, but to a local business. Well, one thing is the majors are just big fish swallowing up smaller fish, you know? And how can you get a handle on anything it was such a big corporate thing? Especially earlier on, independent music really pushed what was then called college music. You know, that's where certain bands broke, R.E.M., I mean, you know, in the 80s, lots of bands broke like that, and the corporate world just didn't facilitate that. Whereas the smaller labels and distributors, it's more personal, you know, who are kind of like us, you know, except they're not record stores, they're labels or distributors. And, you know, it's a sort of like a mom and pop thing, except with uh, labels, and yeah you know, more power to them. And those labels are seem healthy. But everybody I talk to from from uh, labels and, and distributors across the country, they just they just are stunned at the uh, resurgence of vinyl. You know, indie labels and indie stores are kind of offering each other um, assistance in this whole thing that, that I think they'll be able to, you know, I think they'll be able to get over that hump and and continue. It's a little society in here, and, and it's a great little society. Everybody is just great. And uh, why does that have to go away? I like the idea of, of small businesses. Whether, you know, there's a future for them, but it's getting tougher all the time. The store has managed to stay in business when a lot of other locally owned music stores have said, I can't do it, I can't keep up, I can't stay in business, I'm not making any money. You know, there are times when I sort of worry because our total for the day is, is really low. I myself have worked in an independent store in town that has already closed. It's because the people just got tired of working so hard for so little money. This mom top pop uh, type store is it's near its demise, as it is now. I mean, there may be some other incarnations. We're looking for those other forms of uh, surviving. And one of those ways is by selling things on the internet. You have to figure out what they want and be able to stock it and be able to move on and change and, you know, and continue to offer those kind of, you know, those really unique things. People seem to appreciate us a little bit more than they did a few years ago. I don't know if they've just become aware of how hard it is for us to stay in business. Keeping independent businesses in business is good for me. It's what makes my community different from another community. They have their, they have their folks doing what they do. We have ours and variety is a good thing. I think they're in it, you know, the way I'm in it. I don't think the passion that they have is going to go away. You know, we're sitting on what I like to imagine is a gold mine of vinyl. You know, our basement is just chock full of really valuable records. Sarge thinks that uh, the store is going to go back to vinyl completely. In some ways, I think the culture of a record store is, is always going to be kind of alive. Um, especially because vinyl has been getting even more and more popular. There's going to be young kids who are going to grow up and see other people doing it and, you know, get turned on by it. I mean, my feeling is if there's a human culture that's involved, it's not going to die. They had so much spirit for it that it's hard for me to give it up. I'd hate to, you know, take them away from it. I think that it would be a serious loss to the community to, to not be able to help educate people and help turn them on to new things. 
Uh, where would people go? You eliminate that, and you know, you just are alienating more people. I, I know that I would not have very much to do on a Saturday afternoon, except, you know, like, <laughs> flip or go to the record store. No, I'd like to see this business continue. Nice people. If I had to drive by this place and it wasn't a record store anymore, that would be really hard to take. I'd be sad, you know. I mean, not only is a piece of the interesting fabric of a neighborhood gone, but people would lose work. And are we all going to end up working for uh, chains and mega corporations? That, you know, is that the idea? Is that progress? I don't think so. I don't think it's economic health, and I don't think it's cultural progress either. Well, yeah, I mean, just imagine a community where you have nothing but big, big box retailers or, or people uh, going through the mail with things. I mean, can you imagine being a customer <clears throat> maybe you haven't come in for a couple months and you walk up the steps and it says, you know, we're closed and, and all this is empty and there's no more records or CDs in here. Um, I think for a customer, you know, some of them would probably be driven to tears. So if this place was gone, like, that would be like part of our life was, you know, displaced or gone. For small independent record stores to be phased out of our culture is obviously a really sad thing and I think it, uh, you know, shines a big light on the nature of uh, modernity, so to speak. It's just a wonderful uh, continuity in uh, a life uh, or people's lives that where change is constant. It would be sad. I mean, it would definitely take a big chunk of uh, the music culture around town out as far as local bands. Can't say that I'm happy about it. I uh, can't say I know what to do about it other than come over here and buy a record now and again when I can. It's a community service, so I'd like to see people become aware of it and, and come in and visit. Yeah, I really feel that, that I have a place here and that I'm going to be here for many years to come. And I hope that my daughter has a place here when she's old enough to work. I think people go through a period of uh, quiet desperation when they lose uh, a cultural limb. And I think everybody feels it in some way or another. And they may not know what's causing their discomfort, but I think they feel it. As a place, I think that this is very important and that, that we should do our best to keep something like this alive and to fix it up and conserve. We're, we're in the business of conserving old things and making sure that they still stay alive for as long as they possibly can. I think there could be a groundswell of uh, support for people just getting tired of uh, working, trying to make a living for other people. And Start setting down roots and opening their little shops. I don't worry that we're not going to be around, but we're going to have to hustle. And I'm up for it.
Do you like? Um, evil. Who? Evil.